How's it going? Welcome back to the Blue Army Podcast. This is episode 38 and I'm sorry, sorry for having a holiday. Sorry, sorry about that. <laughs> Bloody hell, I didn't time it very well, did I? Did I? You might have heard a little bit of giggling there. That means you could have guessed that everybody's favourite return guest is back. It's Will. Say hello, Wills. Hello, Liam. How's things? <laughs> it's good, mate. It's good. It's really good. Uh, like I said, I've been on holiday. Uh, I'm fully recharged. I'm ready to come back. And there's lots of stuff that we missed this week, it seems, eh? Indeed, yeah. Busy week. Um, potentially potentially a big a big episode for you. Glad to be on it with you. <laughs> That's it, mate. That's it. That's it. Well, I'm buzzing to be having you here. I just want to quickly remind people that um, last week's episode that never happened, obviously, the week before that was an interview with Paul Arneson, former Carlisle United right back, uh, double promotion winning, absolute legend. It was a pleasure to talk to him. Just want to say thank you to him once again. Uh, for helping us out, giving us his time for absolutely nothing. He's a busy man. Uh, he's a manager over there in Australia at the moment. So, yeah, just wanted to say a big thank you once again to Paul Arnie Arneson for giving up his time for absolutely free, not asking for nothing, um, and, and just talking to us, mate, and just giving us a cracking interview. So thanks very much, Paul, mate. <laughs> <laughs> right. What have I got on store for us today, Wills? I'll give you the rundown, shall I? Go on then. Okay. Please. First thing is first. Sam Fishburne watch is over and we'll be discussing what's next for the young Sam. Of course, the big news this week is that Carlisle United have parted company with Chris Beach. Uh, Wills will be taking us through the manager's ups and downs with his time at Carlisle United. We'll be discussing that. And then obviously we'll go on to discuss all the bookies favourites and, and maybe some people that you might not have thought about that might have a chance at the Carlisle United job. And then we'll have a cheeky little look at your reactions. I put a little post out on Facebook and some of you guys commented on there. So that'll give us a little bit more of a jumping off point. So we'll see how you guys feel about the uh, sacking of Chris Beach and uh, who you'd like to see next uh, in charge at Carla United. And obviously that'll be rounded off by the classic match report. Um, which we're going to throw in something a little bit different this week and do a watch along to keep it a bit more spicy. But uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, man, uh, it's, it's going to be a big show this week. Obviously, the bulk of the show is going to be taken up by the big, big news that Carlisle United have parted company with Chris Beach. But first, as per tradition on the Blue Army podcast, we like to get things kicked off with good times and positive vibes. With the Blue Army podcast, joke of the week. Is he having a laugh? <laughs> I think he's trying to. <laughs> the Blue Army podcast, joke, joke of the week. Well, your jingle's funnier than any of your jokes so far. <laughs> I don't know, that tailless monkey joke was brilliant. Yeah. That tailless monkey joke was brilliant. Right, here we go, here we go. Why wouldn't the skeleton get a job? Why wouldn't the skeleton get a job, Wills? Oh, I mean, multiple reasons, but I'd like to know yours. <laughs> <laughs> because he was born idle. Oh, oh. Jesus. Why wouldn't the skeleton get a and, job? Because he was born it. idle. He's only gone and done it. He's only gone and done it. Well, <laughs> mate, it's great to start, it's great to have you back on the show. It's great to be doing jokes of the week, and uh, obviously there's lots and lots to discuss for us. So we'll dive on in, as it were. Um, so after taking some time off, we've missed a few things, and uh, I want to talk about uh, the big big news of Chris Beach leaving. But first, mm -hmm. like we've already tickled a little bit, Sam Fishburne's back. At uh, Brunton Park, he's been brought back from loan uh, from Lancaster, and uh, I mean, I don't think he's going to be going anywhere until a yeah. new manager has had a chance to have a look at him. 
Uh, so yeah. what are you? What, what are you thinking next in store for Sam Fishburne? Or perhaps if you were the new manager coming in, what would you do with Sam Fishburne? Yeah, I mean, so obviously, you know, a new manager's going to come in at some point and, you know, we've got a young lad on the books who's been doing so well in youth team football and then um, in a loan spell. So he's probably going to want to have a look at him and Sam Fishburne probably feels like, especially with kind of like the lack of scoring from the other players, that he has a real chance to stake his claim. He is still young and, you know, the manager whoever comes in is still probably likely to want to either, either he'll know how to get more out of the players that we've already got people like Zach Clough and Tristan Abrahams, or he'll maybe want to bring in an experienced head. So there'll still be people probably ahead of Sam Fishburn, but you know, he has a chance to, you know, to make a claim for why he should, stay at Carlisle rather than being sent out on loan again. I mean, if he was to go back out on loan again, it'd have to be to a much higher level than where he was playing. That was just the playground for him to be scoring goals in down there at Lancaster. But still a step up from youth team football. So, like, he's made one step up and he's come through it really well. So if he makes another step up after this, you know, um, if not too into the Carlisle United team, then... Uh, for example, into a team in the conference, then I'd like to see him playing with. I'd like to see him training on going on loan to a team with at least a full time squad. Uh, so that yeah. would mean probably the national league. Obviously, Wrexham have a full time squad. Um, I think uh, there's someone else uh, in the in the lower leagues that has a, has a full time squad. I as mean, well. a few of them. I imagine Stockport yeah, just, probably do. Um, they're, 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 then, just just outside the uh, the conference is what I'm talking. That division oh, just right, outside yeah. the conference as well. There's only one or uh, two teams yeah. just outside there. But even still, yeah, I wouldn't mind York if you went maybe. on loan to that level. Yeah, York as well. I think are up there. Uh, yeah. Other teams that also have quite rich backers can afford to be full time. I think potentially. I think some players got maybe like a bit of money. South Shields. Mm. Oh, that's right. We've discussed that in the past, actually. Yeah. We discussed that last season, that there was some heavy investment coming in that way. But, um, mate, I don't think that Sam Fish... Bringing it back on to Sam Fishburn, I don't feel like Sam Fishburn's going to be going anywhere for a while. I think if a new manager comes in, they're going to be told by the board that are recruiting to actually play... Fishburn, because I think the board see pound signs when they look at Fishburn. And if yeah. he got a couple of goals this season, they could easily sell him for six figures next year. And that's just putting your foot down as a board and saying, play this lad a bit. You know what I mean? And I think they I think they can be like that with a new manager coming in. I yeah, think they might it depends on the hand a little bit. I mean, yeah, I mean, whether that's a good or a bad thing could depend on the circumstances. Because if we are in for a really difficult season of slogging against, you know, just trying to pick up points here and there, and if we are in for a season where we, you know, go on to lose a good proportion of our games, not always the best thing for a kid to come into, especially a forward if he's not going to get much service. And if he's... You know, if he's going to end up being made to look worse than he is, or, you know, if if we're just in games where the only thing that's going to kind of get us through that is having big, big experience in the squad somewhere. So it depends on how this season goes as to whether it's necessarily a good thing to for the board to be saying to any manager, we want you to play this kid. Yeah. Um, obviously, I'd like to see an experienced striker come in. I think we mentioned that before the transfer window closed and yeah. after the transfer window closed that it was a big yeah. there was a big gap in the attack with no experience really up front. And mm-hmm. obviously, Clough for the last two years has been playing more in a, a wide or a central midfield role rather than as a yeah. striker. And he's obviously came into the squad wanting to be a striker and being given the opportunity to play as a striker as well. So, yeah. Obviously, with a new manager coming in, it might be a bit of a shock to the system for Clough and he might be asked to do a few different things that he might not have been signed up to do at the start of the season. So we'll yeah. see more about his character as the season mm. goes on. Um, but 
Yes, Sam Fishburne, I hope he gets his opportunity. I really do. I don't think that he's going to be out of his depth at this level. I don't want to see him coming off the bench week in, week out and just being given 10 minutes, 11 minutes. I don't think that's going to do his development any favours. So if you're going to do that with the young man, send him out on loan to a full-time team, get him training with that full-time team, not training with us and just playing games with them. Um, But if you're going to play him, play him for at least 60 minutes a game. And if he's really not playing well, then get rid. But you need, you need to give him the chance to gain the experience at this level. And I don't think there's a difference when you throw on a Sam Fishburne in the last half an hour of a game. I don't think he's that kind of a player. I don't think he's an impact sub kind of player. I don't think his game is about pace and stretching defenders like that is about getting in the right position and finding the back of the net. Um, So, yeah, he needs to be starting games. If he's not going to be starting games, and I'd I, I just put yeah. him out on loan. Um, and there's no harm, no foul, putting a kid out on loan yeah. at that age. Yeah, Probably. well, you know, he might get a few games to prove himself. And, you know, we might see in that time if he is going to just, you know, start starting games and scoring goals as, you know, as you hope for in this division. Yeah. As, as, as we said earlier on, I don't think he's going to go anywhere until the new manager has had yeah. a chance. To look at him. So as we're talking about managers, Wills, um, the big news for any Carlisle United fan this week is that the sacking of manager Chris Beach. Um, Although it seems to be a little bit of controversy, was it a sacking or did he hand in his resignation? There seems to apparently be conflicted reports. Um, Yeah. Have you been able to pin it down? No, I mean, I was no. supposed to just say alleged sacking, or but I, I don't think you ever get the full story with any managerial departure these days because there's a lot to negotiate in terms of um, the compensation owed to the manager or paying up his contract. And it seems maybe that in those discussions, the waters get muddied a bit. It's not just a case anymore when a manager leaves the club of him getting a P45 on his desk saying, you're sacked. Um, So you still kind of think that it's a decision taken by the board that Chris Beach would have probably wanted to stay. He probably still did believe in his ability to get the club out of the situation they're in. And I can't see him having sort of chosen to leave. See, the surprising thing for me is that I feel like most of the pressure was coming from the fans. I don't feel like this is a move that the board would have made unless the fans were kicking up a fuss and all the platforms, tagging board members in posts on Twitter and different places. Um, I really, I, I have to say, I, I, I felt like they pulled the trigger a little bit too soon. Uh, we're in a nothing part of the season right now. We're still really early yeah. on. Uh, I feel like there's not a whole host of amazing replacements out there in the world. And we'll go on to discuss that obviously a little bit later on that. I don't think the players were unhappy with Chris because the captain just signed a two year deal. The top goal scorer just signed a two year deal. So I don't feel like the players were unhappy at the club or unhappy with the management. And I really do feel like the fans are the ones that have put the pressure on the board to, to make this move and pull the trigger this early on. Um, Yeah which does show how powerful the fans are. But at the same time, there seems to be rumblings now that people want to protest the board, but they've done what you've asked them to do now. And Mm. I I don't know, it's very conflicting. All the fan forums are very, very conflicting at the moment. Um, Have you seen anything that you've been able to pin any info down that you can support at least? Uh, From on, on like what the fans believe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, no, it's not What's really. Your consensus. I mean, <laughs> yeah, I mean, we could kind of like uh, maybe kind of have a little defense of Chris Beach section because uh, there's certainly a few things that you can say, you, you know, that you can say in his defense. There's a g- general consensus that, um, you know, it's a results game, and when results are bad, the thing to do is change manager. Yeah. And, I think most of the fans seem to be fairly 
fairly united in in believing that it, it was it was the time for Beach to go. Um, and at the same time, I think a lot of the fans they haven't you know they're not going to let up on their criticism of the board. Um, the board now have a very big decision to make over who's got you know who they're going to appoint as the next manager. Um, the questioning of things like who's actually in control of the club, um, who's putting money into the club, who you know who makes the decisions. Uh, that's that's going to become even more intense, I think, during this period because the, the club are in a big you know a big what's the word. Um, slump mm-hmm. at the moment, and the, you know the manager who traditionally is the one that gets a lot of the flack from the fans when things aren't going well, he's now gone. Um, David Holdsworth and the rest of the board are already coming in for a lot of criticism. I think they're just going to come in for even more criticism now, and um, I, I I've heard rumours about a. Uh, a possible fans protest before the next home game. So, as I say, um, sacking the manager is not going to ease any of the pressure on the board at all, I don't think. Yeah, which is also one of the reasons I was surprised that they pulled the trigger this early on. I feel like two more games maybe would have been a fairer, fairer shake of the whistles, but especially compared to how high he's been able to take the team in the past. Um, but Saying that, when I really looked back and digged into it and thought about it, we haven't played good football since January last year, since the whole COVID thing happened. Yeah, we managed to turn things around towards the end of the season, but we weren't doing it against good teams. and We yeah. weren't playing fantastic football. And at the start of this season, some fans said that we, you know, I've said recently that, oh, we're not as good as what we were at the start of the season. And I yeah. would say to that, like, we weren't that good at the start of the season either. Um, we've, just yeah. got, we've just got a bit worse than what we were at the start of the season, but we weren't that good at the start of the season. Um, yeah. we ne- we ne- we didn't, we've never looked like a playoff team yet this year. We've not, <laughs> this season, we've not looked like a playoff team at all. Um, yeah, no. But obviously because of what the bookies say, because of uh, what the odds would have been for us to have reached certain positions in the league, because we were nowhere near predicted to be down there. Yeah. Um, it's, come as, it, it's, come, it's come as a big shock, but we've not played very well at all this season so far. And for the most part of last season, even though we got to the top of the league, for the most part of last season, we weren't yeah. playing great football. We weren't. Um, when it worked, it really worked, but it didn't work for most of last season and it hasn't worked at all this season. So when you really think it down, he's had a lot of opportunities um, because he could have got he could have got sacked last year when we when we didn't win a game for eleven was it eleven games we didn't win a game. Yeah, um, I think you know obviously he had um, he had a certain amount of goodwill built up last year and also the circumstances around our dropping form. Um, I know Carlisle fans generally a bit more critical of the management than football pundits generally, but certainly most of the neutral football pundits last season felt that Chris Beach had been unlucky and that the you know uh, going a whole month without playing any games, having COVID in the squad and not being able to train because of weather circumstances as well that kind of like perfect storm of things that happened just after Christmas. You can say like that's ob- that obviously affected us in some way. And um, a lot of the neutral pundits that I kind of pay, pay attention to were kind of willing to basically blame that for the entirety of what happened in the second half of next season. And, you know, even now um, in the, you know, in the um, articles that they've put together as Chris Beach is now, you know, in the wake of the departure of Chris Beach, um, there's still there's still a lot of those people saying Carl would probably have gotten promoted last season if it wasn't for COVID, which is it's, it's a lot more forgiving, obviously, than fans of United have been. Um and, you know, we've seen firsthand some of the performances last season. Um, my, you know, my personal view on that was that I think, I think it is kind of like probably clear to most people that 
that the the going that whole month without being able to train properly and without playing had a big impact on on our momentum and on our fitness and we were never able to come back from that as the season wore on you know you you could maybe say for the first 10 games after that that we're still losing here and it's because of the January we've had it's really difficult for us um as the season wore on it it became less about fitness and just more about we've kind of got into a losing habit now um I did expect us to just kind of like pick things up this season although didn't I don't think our transfer window went particularly well as well. And and that's another thing that people can say to the, in defence of Chris Beach is that he tried really hard to keep a squad together that started last season really well. And he found that basically the, 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 the club and those above him weren't prepared to really try to keep players like um, Afrande Zanzala, like Paul Farman, like Reese Bennett. I was going to mention a little bit of that, but Wills, you've done a bit of yeah. research about Chris Beach, and I didn't want to tread on your toes at <laughs> all. Um, so I'm, I don't want to go into too much of a debate until you've had a chance to take us through um, some of Chris Beach's ups and downs uh, with his time at Carlisle United, and, and and maybe that'll give all of us a little bit of a better perspective. Um, and we'll be able to make our minds up about whether or not it was a good decision to stick or twist, as it were. Yeah, certainly. So, I mean, I think we can kind of divide Chris Beach's tenure at Carlisle into four segments. He uh, he came in uh, replacing Stephen Presley um, in the 19, uh, yeah, uh, 1920 season. And uh, that season was also cut short because of COVID, but at the time it was cut short, we were kind of pulling ourselves away. We were in a 20th spot when he came in and he oversaw us getting into the third round of the FA Cup. And um, by the time that, but uh, either way, I think we were in 18th when we ended, but we were also looking much safer, to be fair. It wasn't, um, you know, it wasn't a march up the division, and there wasn't a huge amount of wins, but um, I think he it, it did his reputation a world of good. He, by the time the season ended, I don't think anyone was really concerned that we were going to get relegated, whereas uh, at the time Presley was sacked, it seemed like a distinct possibility. So that's the first stage. I mean, Presley's then... squad Presley's squad on paper wasn't a bad squad. It wasn't a squad that should have been in the position that it was. So <laughs> when a new manager came in, he had tools to work with. Um, I, he, I, he proved he was a better manager than Presley. He, he can, yeah. you know, he, and he can, he can still stand on that. Yeah, I mean, like one thing that, um, uh, well, a couple of things really that we can kind of say that he did when he came in was... Um, immediately he started using Aaron Hayden. Uh, Presley never really used him. Mm, uh, mm. Pr- Presley signed Aaron Hayden, but he was a just considered to be a, a bit of a punt on a young right back who'd been released by Wolves and, and never really got a chance under Presley. So um, he, he, he also converted John Mellish into his midfield role, although he didn't really start to do that until the until like a few months into his into his time, I think he was starting to play uh, Mellish in midfield towards the end of that season. Uh, mm. Brought in players like Amari Patrick. He brought in Nick Anderton, who although he was later eclipsed, he, he, Nick Anderton was definitely a good signing in that season. I know right. you kind of say like the season after not so well, and then. Look, well, he's but, sitting, sitting on the bench at Bristol Rovers now. He couldn't even get a game against us. No, no, yeah, he is. Um, it wasn't great against. Well, you know, it wasn't great in the last part of that season against us, and he's not been great for Bristol Rovers. But definitely at that time, we needed a competent left back, and Nick Anderton came in and was a competent left back. Okay. Um, he, he brought in. He, he did bring in Callum Guy at that point as well, but then Guy got injured, so we didn't really see him. For the rest of that season, but you know, he, he came in and he made some, he, you know, he made some changes uh, to the uh, to the personnel. So 
<laughs> kept us on the first. We're still on stage one here. I've got four stages. But... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I can ed- I can edit I can edit bits. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> it's all gold anyway. Fuck it. Keep yeah. going, man. Stage two um, was the first part of last season, and that's that's kind of where beach ball came around and. You know, the, there was a good feeling around the club, even going back to the end of the season before, because we were on an upward trajectory. He made big changes to the squad. It was almost a full overhaul, brought in a lot of new players. I think um, we were the most overhauled squad in the in the EFL that season. Mm. And we we started poorly, but quickly turned it around. I don't know if you remember, we had that um, opening game against Cambridge, uh, which we lost and we beat Southend, and yeah. then lost to Scunthorpe as well. It wasn't a great We'd start also to been, the season. Yeah, I mean, if you include, we played Oldham in the, in the League Cup and lost 3-0, and we even had a game before it all started against Fleetwood in the AFL Trophy, which no one really cares about, but we lost that one 3-1. And yeah, that was. It. I lost... remember the being. I remember that us conceding free a lot at the start of the season. Yeah, yeah. So like two of those weren't in the league, and um, probably. I mean, nobody would really cared about losing three one to Fleetwood in the AFL Trophy, but because because you kind of had those other three, you know, then it becomes part of a stat. You can say we've conceded three goals three times in a row and lost our first three games. We only did lose one game in the league. Um, beat Southend, lost to Scunthorpe, beat Barrow. And then we beat Port Vale and we beat Colchester. And those were the two really good performances that were kind of like propelled us into the playoff contention at that time of the season. And, you know, slow and steady because we had a couple of draws, beat Morecambe, um, good, lost to Exeter, good performance against Newport. And we're still kind of like, dotted around the playoff places the really good spell came uh, around sort of early December we had four wins on the bounce Salford, Bradford Stevenage and Mansfield and then we had um, that game just after Christmas Walsall where we actually went top of the table yes I hate Walsall yeah, so beat Warsaw 2 0 on the 2nd of January, went top of the table, and then our next competitive fixture was against Exeter on the 30th of January. And we actually won that one as well, although we and we had quite a few games in hand. This is where the stage three starts, but at this point, everyone's talking about beach ball. He's one of the hottest managers at this level. Like yeah. I say, I, I spend probably more time reading and listening to the views of other fans as I do Carlisle United fans because I, I go on forums that are, you know, where it's fans of all League Two clubs uh, listen to things like D3, D4 and not the top 20. So And, you know, more so than I do our own fans. So at, at this point, Chris Beach is hot property. Beach ball is the way to go. It's and it, it, it's getting a lot of kind of credit as well for the way we play football. Um, some, you know, when you kind of look, you know, there's some people I've seen, they look back at it and say, well, we were only ever a long ball team. That's because they're not happy now with the way we've been this season. And they just yeah. kind of like... Oh, and they just apply that backwards and just yeah, say it was different. It, was, it wasn't it wasn't long ball football. Yeah, it wasn't exactly. long ball football. It was clever. The, the passes were much cleverer than that. They were they were like curling balls to the outside of the of like of like the, the box. Do you know what I mean? Sort of like looking yeah. to get wingers and strikers on the inside on the foot just to knock it like central and tap in, tap in, tap in. It wasn't just yeah. long, stupid, over the top, really, really high. Long ball yeah. football, really high yeah. long ball football is awful to watch. That wasn't what was happening at all. No, there yeah, were clever there passes. A lot of, Bennett a lot of could pass a ball. Moving. Bennett yeah. could pass a ball. Bennett could actually pass a ball. And so could so could Anderton. And uh, to be fair to yeah. him, like he, he could he could pick a pass from deep. He was just yeah. fucking dog shit defender. 
So, yeah. well, <laughs> so. I mean, I mean, here's the thing. At this point, um, based on XG and also based on based on actual goals conceded and goals scored at various mm. points during this spell, but certainly around December, we were the best defensive team in the division. We let the fewest amounts of shots taken. I think. I think we hadn't quite conceded the fewest amount of goals. I think we had kept the highest amount of clean sheets. So oh, that's a surprise. Okay. So even with the criticism of people like Anderton, we were very good defensively because we just didn't let teams get to us. The thing now, the thing with Anderton, or just with our defending as a as a general thing, was that during this time, the one thing that people always said is Carlisle don't let teams take many shots against them. Mm. And they play most of their football in the attacking third and they defend a high line. Um, that's not necessarily a good positioning on the defender's part. Or, you know, um, there was some good defending, but I think uh, uh, one of the websites ago refers to it as avoiding the issue. Just like, we're not going to concede many goals. We might actually be really bad defenders, but you're not going to find out because we're not going to let you attack. <laughs> yeah. So, like, you know, attack is the best form of defence, and that's kind of why we were so good defensively. Not necessarily because we had really solid defenders, although Hayden and Bennett were very good, and I think Farman was good as a keeper. No, you disagree a bit. <laughs> no, I wasn't. I, was, I, yeah. I never thought Farman was a terrible goalkeeper. That was never yeah. the thing. I I just thought Farman was always going to leave. That's all I said about okay. Farman. I, I always right. said, I never said he was a terrible goalkeeper, but I always yeah. thought he was going to leave. So you may as well start Norman now because we're not getting promoted. So you may as well start yeah. Norman now. Give him some okay. games now because I, I, only, I always thought Farman, Farman, Farman could have gone and sat on the bench for Sunderland for like triple the money that he's on here. Um, but like yeah. you know, Barrow, Barrow stumped up money. He was always gonna. He was, you know, he, I know he's a, I know he's a northern lad, but it doesn't mean he's he was gonna stay yeah. at Carlisle for the money that he was on at Carlisle yeah. for them kind of stats that he was getting. He could have sat on the bench at like a Wigan or something for twice yeah. as much money. Um, uh, so I apologize. You know. I know there's been a lot of confusion in the past about your views on farming. And you've asked people <laughs> writing in, and I've maybe fallen prey to some of that confusion. <laughs> but, yeah, so I mean, but that's us then. Um, we are playing good football and Chris Beach is hot property. And actually people are saying that the, the reason people are giving me at that point for why they don't think I'll get promoted is because your manager and all your good players are going to get poached off you in January. They were like, bigger clubs are going to come in in January. They're going to take Chris Beach. They're going to take John Mellish. They're going to take Callum Guy. And they're going to take... Aaron Hayden and um, yeah, and George Tanner. So like, you know, that was what other fans thought at the time. Um, then after that, so like at this point, we've kind, of, you know, I think we think we've sort of like weathered the storm of January because we've come back, we've come back at the end of January and beaten Exeter. Yeah. So like even stronger belief now this is less than a year ago now this is this is only nine months ago yeah and then but this is the, this is where it started though isn't it this is where the slump really started nine yeah months ago. if you look I at mean, the, if I you look at his game, record for the next, last nine months i'm sure you have i'm sure you have I, well yeah i mean i run the games immediately after that forest green lose harrogate lose salford draw tramia lose Oldham lose, Colchester lose, Morecambe lose, Grimsby draw, <laughs> good win, a good win against Bradford, beat Bradford three uh, one, and then we draw in Mansfield, then Stevenage lose, Orient yeah. lose, Cambridge <laughs> lose. So how many is that? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen games. We have won one, drawn three, and lost. I guess that'll be nine. Mm. Um, and, and you could see in that spell as well, you could see that kind of like the players look tired. Um, and, and you know, and, and maybe that, that kind of like month off had kind of affected their fitness and now it was affecting their morale. And, um, and then we did, we did recover at the end of that season not quite enough to get into the playoffs, 
But, you know, we we went on a three-game winning run against Crawley, Southend and Scunthorpe. Then drew, we drew three, at least we weren't losing. But that was, we that was a spell where if we'd picked up a couple more wins there, then we would have put ourselves... I mean, we did actually at one point get back into the playoffs briefly, but... Yeah, um, bottled it. Yeah, yeah, just too many draws towards the end of that season, ultimately. And, you know, a few people were saying at the time uh, the Chris Beach was at fault, had to go, had no plan B, couldn't turn it round. Um, and then I, I don't think we really need to talk about this season, stage four. Um, it's it's also recent. We've not been good, and we've been getting gradually. You know, uh, the last three games, three defeats have been really poor. So there's there's stage four for you. <laughs> no, I mean, it's recent. It's recent in everyone's memory, so I don't need to go into detail on it. Yeah, mate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean. It's not been a great start to the season. Um, yeah. Obviously, if you add if you add this season to the last thirteen games of last season, I think yeah. combined, like that's like you know only three to f- maybe four wins in the last like twenty four games or something. Yeah, I mean, I will say I've never been a fan of kind of like adding the end of one season to a run of form because you know. Different seasons are different, and it does sound a bit like it's the sort they're, of thing people. They're equally as bad. They are equally as bad, um, but I think it's you know each new season is a new roll of the dice, and often you know you only ever hear people bringing last season into it if they want, if if they're wanting their stats either to sound good or to sound bad. <laughs> so. I, if we have a decent start to this season, nobody cares about how we ended last season. You know what I mean? Yeah, you don't have to. You don't. You don't. I, I'm not necessarily. Add, yeah. I did add them together, but I'm not yeah. necessarily. Add, the, oh, the, yeah. the main point. The main point is they're both equally as bad. Like, yeah. you know I mean, you, yeah. you can compare the start of last this season to the end of last yeah. season because we've on the ratio of win losers and draws. You know that's kind of yeah neck and neck let's say so you can kind of see where where it was going last season and the fact that it hasn't got better any this season at all at the start of this season yeah and, you know maybe that's why the board have pulled the trigger a little bit sooner than than some people think they should have maybe yeah. because because they've seen it go this way before and they, they, we don't have the points to go through a bad run of form right now we need you know yeah <laughs> need to dig ourselves out of the situation that we're in but um, talking about rolling the dice a while ago. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because I thought that would be a good segue and then I forgot yeah. and then started talking. But um, yeah, Carlisle are going to end up rolling the dice on some new management. I just want to quickly say that uh, Gav Skelton has been placed in caretaker charge. Mm. And as I take us through the bookies' early favourites, um, he is in there, so we will talk about him. But the person that has risen to the top of the bookies' favourites, as this as this stands right now, is a yeah. former Carlisle United captain and top goal scorer, Danny Granger, um, is risen to the top of the favourites for the bookies. Um, yeah, he, he on paper looks just as acceptable as any candidate, I suppose, for a Carlisle job. Um, but if you're going to consider consider somebody like Danny Granger, you could consider a whole host of ex Carlisle United players like Peter Murphy um, and Paul Arneson. But we'll go on to discuss like things like that um, because they're all sort of equal levels of management history. Um, yeah. Danny Granger has been quite successful over at Workington. Obviously, he knows Carlisle United pretty well because of his time there. What are your initial reactions to the fact that Danny Grange is the current favourite for the Carlo United job? Um, no, I, I think I probably want someone with a bit more league experience. And I'm always a bit some wary about... Lists. Well, it's contact lists. Mind you, every time someone says about managers having contact lists, I just think about Graham Kavanagh because 
because he was the king of contact lists. <laughs> didn't really but work out. Somebody, yeah, but you need somebody with a mix of experience of management experience and yeah. a good contact list. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Kavanagh yeah, yeah. never had good management experience <laughs> and a good contact list. He only had a good yeah. contact list, no experience. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, but still, I don't know. I kind of like worry that you know, we'll kind of bring back some club legend and tarnish his reputation if things go wrong. I'm always a bit worried about that. Um, and especially the fact, you know, when it's it's often as well, I think I see it anyway, as an attempt by the board to try and kind of deflect a bit of criticism and get a bit of kind of feel good by appointing a fan favourite. And that'll keep everyone happy for a while. But you know, if 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 it doesn't work out, um, you know, fans are no less quick to turn on a player who was, uh, to turn on a manager who was a former player, than they are. Um, if you look at, I mean, uh, Kavanagh was a former player, although admittedly he hadn't like spent his best years at the club. He's not like necessarily a club legend, but he was a former player turned on very quick. If you look at other clubs, um, uh. Jack Lester was turned on quite quickly at um, Ch- uh, Chesterfield w- when they were in trouble. Um, Solskjaer at Man U, um, oh, he's doing better now when he wasn't doing well. You know, Man U fans had no sentimentality for the fact that it was Ole Gunnar Solskjaer. They were like, no, he's crap, get rid of him. So Yeah, yeah you're right, yeah, you're right. I would say um, Newcastle fans never turned on Shearer. They didn't, but Shira, I think Shearer's spell was brief and they were already as good as down when he took over, weren't they? <laughs> I think he just blamed it all on Michael Owen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's what I think. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Shearer's not at all anywhere near the bookies' favourites for taking over Carlisle, so don't worry. <laughs> don't worry. Don't worry. <laughs> Don't worry. Um, but yeah, Danny Grange is the current number one favourite. Now, I wasn't intending on necessarily doing this in any kind of order, but we'll do the number one and twos because uh, yeah. Danny Granger is neck and neck with Gavin Skelton, who currently is the caretaker manager. Uh, Gavin Skelton in the past, when ha- when he was the caretaker manager, um, I think, what was that? Just after Cav, I think. Uh, uh, was he like, was he in one of them kind of like joint caretaker manager roles it's because it's he's been at the club for a while but then leaves and then comes back and then he's been in a few different roles um yeah. it was just after presley just after presley yeah care, care, did we not have oh no yeah like, of course i was thinking of I, I was thinking of tommy wright but that was between he, he was presley's assistant for a little bit after being john sheridan's Oh god, John Sherry. Yeah, uh, it must have been Skelton after Presley, because I think Skelton was Presley's assistant as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean currently he's caretaker manager, he's been caretaker manager before. Last time he was caretaker manager, he did say that he didn't want the job on a full time basis. Um, yeah. so unless he's changed his mind, uh, then you know, a lot of Carlisle fans think that he should have left with Chris Beach. Um so there is a, a, a small portion of the Carlisle United contingent yeah. that feels as if um, he he shouldn't be at the club anymore. He's been around a while. Uh, he's gone through a couple of managers, and um, you know it's uh, one of those, isn't it? Some some fans feel like yeah. he hasn't really learned anything from anyone worth learning anything from, perhaps, and he's not going to uh, have any better a go at it than yeah. the managers that he's seen fail. And there you go, a local lad and former player, but there's no sentimentality. So, yeah. I don't, and I, I think the, the board would maybe just want to appoint him as the, as the cheap option and him maybe just become the next Cav, which is not a necessarily a scathing attack on his footballing ability or his coaching ability because I don't know anything about it but just like appointing him as a cheap option possibly just kind of like the board kind of you know following that pattern again that they did with Kavanagh well, Gav Skelton is equal odds with Danny Granger. They're yeah. both 5-1 to one with the bookies. Uh, like you said um, another 
past player for Carlisle United, although it was right at the start of his career when he was at Carlisle. He went over to Workington, then Gretna. Uh, he did his bit around here. Uh, he worked, played for Barrow as well and Annan. So he is very much a, a local guy who, who loves his football. Yeah. Um, but speaking about Annan, the next person on my list is number 12 to 1 odds and Blue Army TV's favourite personal choice for the job. Uh, it's Peter yeah. Murphy. Um, Peter Murphy. Now, I haven't heard the best of stories about Peter Murphy, and I feel like maybe he needs a couple more years um, in yeah. management first before going. It might just be a bit too much, a bit too soon for Murphy. Again, another person yeah. like Skelton and like Granger, who won't necessarily have a good contact list, uh, doesn't necessarily have league experience, and um, it, might be, it might be a difficult first full-time job in management for them yeah Perhaps maybe a bit too much too soon yeah i mean it's, it's going to be difficult for anyone who comes in so um unless they've got like the ability to turn us around fast then you know whoever does take over is probably going to have a long hard season and there's they're probably going to have a section of the fan base that dislike them no matter what, unless they, you know, unless they do come in and just play beautiful football and get us up the league. Yeah. I mean, I mean, it's another one of those players that's in that list of ex Carl United players that most fans would probably just be happy with is also a cheap option. Yeah. Ticks the boxes for the board, ticks the boxes for the fans, and you know, ticks the boxes financially, but not necessarily uh, a few months down the line. Yeah, yeah, not necessarily one of the uh, like like a, a great option uh, that you, that you'd really get excited about seeing. Um, mm-hmm. Just because lack of experience, not not because of anything like controversial. <laughs> yeah, but um, yeah, the last person that I've got on my um, on the bookies list that I've sort of put together for myself is uh, Gary Caldwell, um, recently manager of Patrick Thistle. He's 16 to 1 odds. Um, he sort of bowed out of football after five years at Wigan. Uh, that's where he sort of like did a little bit of coaching on the side as well. He's also in the odds for the Newport County job and the Sheffield United uh-huh. job. So he's been touted Sheffield around United. the place. Um, yeah. so, sorry, South, South, South End United. Oh, right. <laughs> um, so he's been he's been touted around the place. Um, he's obviously been manager at Chesterfield. He did take over at Wigan for a little bit. Um, didn't have the best of times at Wigan, unfortunately. Um, doing a difficult period for the club. And um, then he's most recently been with, with Patrick Patrick Thistle. Um, yeah, I, I feel like he brings something different to the table. He would have a pretty decent contact list and maybe be able to bring something different to the team and shore up that defence, perhaps, because obviously being a former defender himself, he might be able to sort out that defence uh, a little bit and, and just sort out the leaks. I don't think we've got a bad squad. I feel like a manager could come... It, it's not a bad job for a manager to come in and go, um, I'll put Zach Clough up front and then, um, you know, give some confidence to Jack Armour at left-back, give some confidence to... Brennan Dickinson at the left and just fire stuff down the left. Do you know what I mean? And, and just get it yeah. into the fucking box. You know, it wouldn't be that hard to fucking come up with a game plan, give some confidence to a few players and really kickstart the season. So, yeah, yeah I'd like to see, <laughs> I'd like to see the defence get sorted out and um, I'd like to see somebody that can bring in an experienced striker. And I feel like Gary Caldwell is a player that could, uh, potentially have the contact list to bring us a pretty decent striker that could uh, help out young Sam Fishburn with uh, a bit of knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, maybe we'll get the best out of every world. So as far as the bookies goes, they're all the things yeah. that sort of uh, yeah. entertain me. Have you got any, uh, any, any comments on the Gary Caldwell there? No, I mean, um, I haven't, you know, that's completely out of the blue for me. I don't really know anything about him other than that he managed around him. before. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's an interesting one, but like I say, I, I don't know enough about him to say whether I think that you have a point or not. Uh, but I'm just interested in what you have to say about him and the kind of manager that we're looking for. 
that leads you know the that you just described there. Yeah, um, I feel like he'd be you know a pretty decent player. Obviously, being yeah. over at Celtic and stuff might help. Being over at Wigan um, might help, and at the contact yeah. lists, and obviously with Chesterfield um there as well so he might have a couple of decent players up his sleeve that could really come in and help us out so i'd like to move on to some of my tipped favorites buddy before we move completely away from the subject of uh managers um number one on my list is the last episode's interviewee paul arneson paul arneson is currently manager over in the australian b league with a team that should have been relegated this season, according to many pundits and board members, and are currently sitting just outside the playoffs with only two games left to go. Um, I feel like he's just as good a candidate as a Peter Murphy would be, as a Danny Granger would be. Uh, Mm. I'd say similar amount of experience, somebody who loves his football, somebody who's a defender, somebody who knows the club inside out, somebody with a natural passion for football and somebody with like I'm saying the same amount of managerial experience as anyone else um that's being touted around at the sort of 12 to 1 sort of odds level for the Carlisle United Mm. job so I feel like you know it it wouldn't necessarily be a bad candidate and I think he wants it I think he wants the job mate I do think he wants the job Uh, the next person that I've been tipped off about. I got a message from another ex Carlisle United player who was a former interviewee. Derek Holmes gave me a tip on a man called yeah. Warren Feeney. Warren Feeney is a player that uh, started his career at Leeds and he ended up just sort of going back home to Ireland towards the end of his career. Mm. Um, he did have a, he's, he got a lot of caps for Ireland as well. Um, most recently, He's been managing over in Bulgaria and he won okay. uh, a, league, a league title over in Bulgaria. He's been assistant manager at Crawley Town and Notts County uh, in 2017, 2018 with Harry Kuehl. Um, And then he's been at Newport County. Um, he's also managed over in Ireland with Linsfield. So he's got a, bit of, a whole host of experience and obviously he's been willing to do a bit of travelling to stay within management. And, yeah. um, you know, I feel like he, he might be an outside choice. I haven't seen his name mentioned at all by any, any bookies or anything. I have seen yeah. Harry Kiel's name mentioned a lot. Um, he's obviously somebody that's gone out there and had a view to how to play football. And he's been able to go out and gather the experience and, and play his own style of football. And it, obviously it got, he got it working in Bulgaria with the team that he had over there. Uh, I will say, interestingly enough, that team in Bulgaria have just been bought by an Abu Dhabi business investment group. So it, yeah. he might get a bumper deal and we might not be able to afford him. So we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> Well, well, I guess we'll just have to see sort of what happens there. Um, but yeah, I feel like that 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 might be I'm not somebody that I would have ever thought about uh, nominating for the Carlisle job. But after sort of looking up his CV, um, thanks to Derek giving us a heads up, looks like a decent shout actually on paper. Yeah, I mean, uh, I can kind of you know I can I can kind of get behind the idea of like looking at a manager who's got a, a lot of varied experience. Maybe more for, you know, if we're kind of like looking up, I don't know if it's necessarily the sort of appointment you want to make if you're kind of worried about relegation this season. Mm. My thoughts on kind of like a manager would be uh, finding a manager who can play the right kind of football for the players that we've got. I think that's kind of like a more important thing than people often kind of look at. Um, and you know, I that's kind of like research that someone like David Holdsworth's gonna have to do because I can't, I, you know, fans tend not to really know much about the style of football that other teams and other players play unless they're like particularly well known. But there's plenty of videos that can be watched of you know, p- prospective managers and how they play. Um, because what you get when um, you know, uh, when a, a manager like uh, what we had with Chris Beach kind of enters that kind of like really difficult point of their career, quite just before being sacked, is that is, is that you get the accusation of 
he's no plan B. He, he has one way of playing and he can't switch it. And that's kind of something that we talked about on here before that um, despite all the changes to the personnel, Chris Beach was still trying to get us to play beach ball. He was still trying to get us to like win the ball high up the field, but we didn't have the right players to do that. And the, and the end result was it just became very long ball because there was nobody kind of picking the ball up. So he just sailed over and over and um, the strikers ended up chasing it. And, you know, the, and, and the criticism comes that like he, he needs to change it. Why isn't he changing it? He's got no plan B. And, but that's something that you see over and over with different managers um, uh, managers at other clubs. You hear other fans saying that their manager who's struggling has no plan B. Uh, we said it about Presley. We said it about um, Curl, and we said it about Abbott. And I, I, I think we probably said that Kavanaugh has no plan A. To be fair, but um, so like, <laughs> but what the what that's kind of like led me to uh, like my own conclusion is that. Um, most managers don't have a plan B. They have a way of playing because getting a team to play a certain way is it is more complicated than just kind of like planning the system on paper and saying, right, this is how we want you to play. You've got to know how to coach the players into playing that way. Mm. Um, you know, you've got to know all, all the possibilities as well. You know, you can't just say we're going to play in this way. You've got to then kind of like apply that, apply that tactic to what if the opponents do this, uh, what do we do in this situation? So like, you know, a set of tactics to play in a certain system, probably a lot more complicated than us fans tend to think. And therefore, you know, any manager down at this level probably has their way of playing and it's, just too much for them to like if they end up with as Chris Beach has with maybe not the players or you know not the squad that he hoped to go into the season with and he's got players like Zach Clough who don't really fit in with the way that he hoped he was playing then um, you know although it might seem simple to just be like well play another way then <laughs> that's ultimately, ultimately perhaps that's not possible because he, he, you know, even if Chris Beach sees the problem, he doesn't have the experience or knowledge to coach the players into playing, into playing a different way. And you've, and and then what you've got to do is you've got to kind of change the manager and find a manager who already has that, you know, playing in that way, rather than expecting to simply sign a good manager and hope that he can then adapt himself to the players available. Yeah. Got to kind of... But then that kind of like, I, I, I then have no answer to follow that up by, because then the <laughs> question is like, well, I don't know how any of these managers who were on our shortlist, I don't know what their style is, um, if any of them... I mean, I think we can kind of like hazard a guess at what style would probably work best for us. Um, with with players like Zach Clough and, to an extent, Abrahams, um, we've still got... Um, well, we've got Mampala, we've still got Toure. We need ball to feet. We need yeah. ball to feet attacking third, which is maybe kind of would have worked under Beach if we had the right plays in other places to uh, to get the ball down and make sure that um, once we got into the attacking third, the ball was on the ground. So uh, we, we need a manager who can kind of like either train the players that we've got to play in a way that suits um, uh, the likes of Clough or... Or a manager who's able to maybe bring in one or two other players, extra players, to uh, to make that system work. Yeah, I, I know from personal um, friendships from old yeah. uh, work Workington heads that Danny Granger likes to play out from the back, but on the ground. Yeah. Um, so you know that might that might be a better appointment. And Mur Murph, I think, is yeah. also the same as that. I feel like he likes to play out from the back. Do we have ground. players to play out from the back on the ground? I think um, Whelan's looking like he's 
you know, he, he has that. I don't think McDonald really does. I think Mella um, does. Yeah, Mella. And um, I'm... Uh, I don't he hasn't think been shown really it a... recently. No. He hasn't been shown it recently. But he was he could yeah. he could last year. He could he could carry the ball last year, play yeah. one two. Yeah, um, yeah. But when you play just... the ball along the ground, you've still got to be going forwards with it. Because if you're in defense, you know, it doesn't matter how you get the ball out of defense, you've got to do it fairly promptly, post haste, you know, not just kind of like keep it there forever. Yeah, true. Yeah, um, some of the other names uh, I'll, I'll quickly fire off that caught my eye at least, and and the odds around those. Um, Michael Bridges is a ten to one odds. I wouldn't um, waste your money on Michael no. Bridges becoming Was the next Italian about about manager. Last time. <laughs> I think he got messed about a bit last time, and also <laughs> yeah. I think he used that to get a little bit more money out of his TV contract yeah. over in Australia. And he yeah. obviously he's got family in Australia, so I don't think he'd necessarily be overly keen about relocating now yeah. um, or making the journey back even for an interview. To be completely honest, and. Um, He's at 10 to 1 odds. I wouldn't waste your money on that. I wouldn't waste your money on Saul Campbell. That's 12 to 1. Um, I don't think he I don't think he's coming up here. Uh, just don't, uh, I mean, I just, you I'm, know, <laughs> I he, he makes a lot of noise about how he's kind of like you know willing to take almost any job. So mm. <laughs> where do would he be? Yeah. Yeah, I mean he'll have to put his his well he won't get any money where his mouth is if he comes here, but <laughs> <laughs> That's 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 another yeah. that's another reason I don't necessarily think he'd take the job. Um, yeah. Same for Harry Cool. I don't think we could pay him enough money to take the job, and I don't think he'd be a good fit. Uh, but I think yeah. he'd be a great. I think he'd be a great photo op. Um, same for Robbie Fowler. Um, he's over in India, managing over in India. There's lots of money over there. I think there's yeah. a reason why he's been over there for two or three years now is because he's getting paid some good money to be there, and I think he yeah. quite enjoys it. And I think he quite likes the anonymity, I guess, of Indian football. So, yeah, yeah, I feel like I don't think he's coming anytime soon. That's at 25 to 1 odds. Um, Ian Holloway at 14 to 1 odds would be no. fucking great. Really? No, no. Really? No. Do you see what he did? He ruined Grimsby. Uh... <laughs> I think it, Ian Holloway doesn't know how to manage at this level. I think we saw that with Grimsby last season. Nice. Right, okay. Yeah, you don't think he can he can manage at this level. Okay, no. fair enough. Fair criticism. Kevin Nolan is another name that caught the eye. He did all right in his spell. At, um, was he in Notts County for a bit? Um, mm-hmm. Didn't last that long with them, but I think nope. it was he's one of these that when he was sacked, they weren't doing too badly and maybe should have kept him. 20 to 1. For uh, for Kevin Nolan, uh, Matt yeah. Janssen is twenty five to one. I feel like Matt Janssen's just has got the same amount of chances that like Danny Granger or anyone else would have yeah. um, managing Chorley that are a level. Uh, that I think I don't know, pretty similar to Workington's level anyway, yeah. if not the same. It was a while ago, so, now wasn't it? You what? Sorry, it was a while ago that he was at Chorley, though, wasn't it? Oh, oh, he's managing somebody now. I just I was pretty uh, sure yeah. maybe stock. I think he's managing Stockport now, maybe. All uh, right. Yeah, maybe I'll have to have, have another dig into that. 25 to 1 on Matt Janssen. My personal favourite and somebody that I've been screaming to get the Carlisle United job for a very long time is none other than Ziggo Aronalde. He's 25 to 1 odds once again. Yeah. Uh, and, <laughs> and, and and yeah, I'll put a fiver on it because I will. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, kind of like, you know, in my head, uh, you know, I don't necessarily take these seriously now because... It is just every time we have a managerial appointment, then I think the bookies are just looking to kind of get a bit of money from from fans who are like, you know, former players that they fancy. The bookies will offer odds on them. I mean, like, for example, all those extremely long odds, the bookies always give odds on Jimmy Glass being the next United manager because they know that a few people will have a cheeky little flutter on that. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a, that's kind of more about bookmaking tactics than it is about actual football. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's just daft, mate. It's just daft. <laughs> is there is is there anyone that I haven't mentioned yet or at all uh, yeah, so far um, that you, you'd want to throw into the hat for the next Carlo United manager? John McGreal mm. must have been on the list. I think he is 
mentioned he is high somewhere. Up the, he, is high up the list. he is high up the list. He is high up the list. Yeah. I mean, so he's another one of those, like, you know, like what we talked about with Nolan, where he was, he was sacked for being mediocre at a club where actually mediocre, you know, actually being mediocre is a bit of an achievement. Um, Colchester in all kinds of difficulty behind the scenes over the last couple of seasons. Um, you know, like we had with Notts County when we mentioned Nolan, they're a bit of a basket case club. So, you know, I think I think that Colchester perhaps shouldn't have sacked McGreal. They've found it difficult, you know, they've found it even more difficult since, and I think maybe he was doing a pretty good job there. Um, he's Scottish, so I don't know if that makes it more likely for him to be up here because he, he's previously managed Colchester and sort of Swindon. Mm. Although we know <laughs> he had that kind of thing at Swindon where he was appointed manager and then quit before the season started. Again, to do with uh, the poor ownership there. Um so, like, I don't know, maybe he's based down south now with those two clubs being his previous two, but maybe he does have still have kind of, like, links up in Scotland. Maybe he does still have family there, and maybe that's kind of... Maybe Carlisle doesn't seem, like, so far out of the way to him. Um, again, you know, I don't know much about his playing style. Maybe he's completely the wrong playing style, but I think he'd probably be, in terms of, in terms of his experience and recent experience... I think he, and the fact that he's currently out of work, so he is kind of like within our, you know, within our means to get. <laughs> um, I think I think it it definitely be one of the ones that I'd take a longer look at. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Anyone else? No. <laughs> no. no. All right, okay. We, I feel like I covered it pretty well then in that case. No worries. Yeah. Um, we'll move on and we'll have a little cheeky look at the uh, social media posts. So I'll put out a little post just asking for a couple of Calais United fans to give us their opinions mm-hmm. on Chris Beach's uh, sacking, whatever, whatever. We're not quite sure what it was yet. And um, yeah. departure from the club, we'll say. Um, and, uh, and and see if they'd like to see anyone else in the job. So uh, Courtney Johnson said, uh, personally, I would have give him a few more games. Found him quite arrogant in interviews, but thought when played passing football, it was brilliant to watch. Would love a manager like Ian Holloway. <laughs> not the sort of, uh, not the sort of manager where we all say it. He okay next season. Let's push on this season and sort it out. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> obviously, you, you voiced your opinion on Ian Holloway. You don't. You, you don't. Yeah, you don't yeah. Like Ian Holloway. You've already said and that. He's a big name. He's a big name, and he is a, a big name. People. He's managed in the Premier League, and a lot of people, you know, rightly expect him to be really good at this level. Mm-hmm. But just hasn't been able I mean, to he's... prove it. Yeah, he's only is. I mean, I think Grimsby are the only club he managed down here, unless he kind of like you know before he kind of made his way up to the Premier League. I don't know where. I think he managed Bristol Rovers once upon a time, or maybe he just played for them. Um, but yeah, he. Um, if you ask any Grimsby fan what they think of Ian Holloway, they that they rate him among the worst managers ever to manage Grimsby. They just say he was clueless. Didn't know what he was doing. He made bizarre decisions that took what was on paper a half decent squad and just saw them go get relegated without even putting up so much of a fight. So Grimsby fans would probably laugh at you if if you said, I, I really fancy Ian Holloway if he's interested in the job. <laughs> Uh, we'll move on. David McKenna, he said um, that Chris Beach was unintangible when interviewed, so has no chance of imparting a game plan. Seriously think this was one of his failings. Um, so maybe bad communication from Chris Beach is what David's saying there. Maybe the message is not getting across to the players about how he wanted them to play football. Maybe. Um, I did see, like, uh, in one of the games, Rob McDonald was a bit 
frustrated with Chris Beach for the presumably for the way Chris Beach was asking him to play, whether that's actually a poor communication or whether it's just a poor game plan that McDonald disagreed with. I don't know, but um, because I mean, you know, you don't necessarily know what he's actually, you know, if he's if his kind of post-match comments to the media are sometimes a bit waffly and not always, you know, a bit nonsensical. But, um, It'd be a bit blunt. Yeah, but, you know, managers aren't always the same. Uh, yeah. You know, they have different... Sometimes they have a persona in front of the media. Sometimes they just don't like talking to the media. I, I don't know if it's necessarily that, you know, watching his interviews, that would be a window into what he's like in the dressing room. Pro- we probably don't really know. Yeah. Uh, Callum Little said uh, he needed to play young players a lot more because they performed better, like the Everton match. They performed better than the normal squad. Um, I think that's fair comments. I feel like he did need to give the youth a bit more of a chance uh, like I said about Fishburne, I don't think Impala's been able to have a proper good look in this season when Tristan's had multiple chances. Um, yeah, he's scored a couple of goals, but you know he's had multiple chances uh, where Impala could have maybe gave us something a bit different uh, in the last sort of like four to three or four games. What do you think yeah. about that one, man? Do you feel like we we weren't utilising the youth as much as we should have been? Do you feel like players like Bell, Charters? Um, Impala, um, Fishburne, yeah. could also I mean, have know. been given a couple more minutes. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know about the others. Um, Charters, we saw plenty of, and I, I feel confident that Charters is 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 good enough and ready enough uh, to make the step up into playing regular first team football. Um, so you know, we can probably assume that some of the others who. I can't speak about because I haven't really seen them the, much, you know, the likes of uh, Lewis Bell. Um, the, you know, there's probably going to be some players in there that can kind of like step up and do really well also. Whether that's a specific failing of Chris Beach, I don't know. Yeah. Um, so let's go up and we're going to finish that little portion, mate, and we'll just do the classic match report with a twist. All right. Um, mm. we're going to talk about Carlisle United's 3-0 defeat against Bristol Rovers but we're going to try and do it in, in, in a, like a blast we're going to just sort of like try and try and get through it as quick as we can in the most enjoyable way possible Yeah. Um, as per usual when I'll you say us... enjoyable <laughs> <laughs> you know it'll be what it'll be but it'll be over as quick yeah. as possible it'll be over as yeah, quick yeah, as possible yeah. Um. So it won't be too painful. But uh, yeah, we'll blast through it. And uh, if the listeners out there, if you want to join in, gag in, um, you can go on YouTube, type in the highlights. We've been calling them the low lights for Carlo yeah. United versus Bristol Rovers. And we'll do a little watch along sort of thing. Yeah. And I'll say, so, I'll, I'll, I'll maybe shout pause every now and again, but I'll try not to very yeah. often. And yeah. uh, we'll get through it in no time. It's only two minutes and two seconds, the highlights. But uh, yeah, I'll give you a Two minutes and two, mine says two minutes and one. Uh, okay, fair enough. I'm pretty sure it'll be fine. Though. Hopefully, we're looking at the same highlights. Um, I'm, I'm sure they'll be fine. Official CUFC. Yeah, I just on YouTube, okay. like on the YouTube. probably on yeah, the, yeah, yeah. On the, on the oh, yeah, I'm on the official on UFC one. thing. Yeah, I'm on the official. Right. Yeah, I'm not giving Bristol Rovers the views, Mara. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, the Carlisle United lineup for Chris Beach's last ever match in charge of Carlisle United is as follows: Jensen. In goal, there was injury to Norman this week and Jensen has been brought in to replace him and he'll probably be there for a while unless we can look to bring in somebody else. But I don't mind Jensen being there, even though the yeah. result was what it was. Uh, Divine, Feeney, Whelan and Armour is your back line. So Divine there at right back. Um, Alessandra, Guy and Mellish in the midfield with Clough, Young and Dickinson playing in the front facing Three, so uh, the lineup obviously quite different, quite experimental, um, quite brash when you look at it. There was yeah. a lot of yellow cards during the game, so um, 
it seemed a bit desperate, maybe, uh, for Chris Beach's last game in charge. What, what, what were your initial reactions to the starting lineup? Yeah, it was uh, pretty different. He's kind of trying different things. Uh, some of it forced through injuries. Um, so the defence is a bit makeshift, but um, uh, I think, so. you know, with Kelvin Meller and Rob McDonald both out, are both out injured. We've had to kind of do what we can. Um, I kind of was listening to Radio Cumbria and they had it down as a 4-2-3-1 formation. Or mm. is it 4-2, maybe 4-2-1-3. Or 4-2-3-1. But they had they had it with Zach Clough in their in their minds was it was gonna be speci- you know, specifically uh, in a deep lying role just in front of a midfield two so that, right. well a deep I think they saw it as a deep sitting midfield two of Guy and Mellish mm-hmm. with Clough playing between them and the and and Young as a lone attacker and Dickinson and Alessandra providing wide support. Yeah I I think mm, I think I would have liked to have seen Gibson slotted in there somewhere. He's injured it was well, on the he, bench. It was on the bench. Yeah, he's he came, back he came, from injury. He came, he, came, he came on and played. Yeah, a lot I minutes. think I think that yeah I think that is I think the reason he wasn't in the starting lineup was because he's been injured. Okay. Okay. I mean, makes sense. Makes sense. Yeah. Um. So yeah, let's uh, let's go on and we'll do the little watch along sort of thing. Uh, I'm on the yeah. YouTube now. You're right. It's two minutes and one second, and uh, I've obviously hit mute yeah. and. Um, no, I've no done it anyway. <laughs> oh, that's right. Yeah, that's right. No, yeah. that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think because it was an advert at the start, I hit mute. Um, but uh, anyway, um, counters in. Yeah, I'll, I'll go three, two, one, then click, mate. All right. Yeah. Three, two, one, click. All right. So we got okay, the I think we're gonna get that. I think we're gonna get the title first. <laughs> so here comes Bristol Rovers over the top. Uh, Fina looks a bit out of position there. Yeah, I think that was well uh, wide of the goal. Though, speculative, yeah, about. speculative shots from a long way out. Guy with but a yeah, nice ball in there. Yeah, that's um, a penalty nice. to me. I'm gonna pause Just that there, the... mate. I'll go back like to to night like twenty seconds maybe. I want to yeah. look at that. I'm on look at that again. And then the an ball goes into Alessandra. I pause. Are you counting us into? 23 I'm seconds. on 20 seconds. 23. I'm on 23 now. Okay, so I'll go back to 20 <laughs> seconds. Yeah. Okay, and then yeah. in three, two, one, go. That Callum balls in again. Yeah, good ball. Is that a penalty? Uh, it was the was it was the contact with defeat the there? Actually, there was a shot don't from know. Dickinson Doesn't as well. Claim, we don't claim anything. No, there was a shot from Dickinson as well, and yeah. it wasn't that good. Here comes Bristol Rovers. It's, it's it is nice play this actually, and he he just skins him inside out and scores there. Yeah, um, I mean you know the the other defenders are in decent positions, but he a good finish from a tight angle. If you know if that if that ball doesn't go in, then you probably say that we kind of restricted him to a tight angle. Interesting yeah. this. From, I'll pause that. I'll pause that there. Even. I'll pause that there on the one minute mark. And we'll go back to 52 seconds and uh, we'll hit play. Okay, in count us in. Three, two, one. There's a header flick on there and it's, it's Zach Clough there, isn't it? That's good goalkeeping. That yeah, goalkeeper's out really he quickly comes there. out, yeah. It's, it is long ball football. You don't want to see it, but it was quite effective yeah. there. Corner in now, header at the back post, over the top from, was it Feeney there? I think it was Feeney. Uh, f- I can't see, yeah. This is another corner in here. There's a shout for him out to Guy. Something on Malish. Was there? Yeah. All right. We'll hit pause there. One minute 20. I think, we'll yeah, go... Malish does indicate that he thinks he was shoved. I'm going to go back to one minute 10 to the start of that corner. Corner comes in. Yeah. Just watch Malish just pass. He's just, well, you can see him just before you click play. The num- You can see him on the, beyond the far yeah. post. So I'm on one so... minute 10. Okay. Three, two, one. Ball's coming in now. 
Uh, Sim Ellis indicates with his elbow and his neck what he thinks happened. Yeah, I don't really see anything doing there, to be fair. Bristol Rovers on the attack on this left-hand side. Born in, poor defending. Left his man wide open there. There's nowhere near him. Dickinson's marking nobody. Um, Yeah, wide open. 2-0 Bristol Rovers. And it's too easy. Fall... And this is a good yeah, ball Yeah, we kind of go here. to pieces at this point. Yeah. Again, good play ball three. In. Jensen nope. slow to react there for me as well. Yeah. Jensen should have rushed in there. He didn't look like he rushed yeah, in. Yeah, we all. have like... I know it's 2-0. Isn't it? Yeah. 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 I know it's 2-0. So those are the highlights, obviously. Uh, we'll leave yeah. them where they die. Um, you know, I know it was in like 94th minute there, but I feel, and, and we were 2 0 down in the 96th. But I feel like Jensen could have done better on the last one. He could have been off his line a bit faster on the last yeah. one. You could you could see that happening from the minute the ball was played from the midfield into the attacker. Yeah. As a goalkeeper, you should be able yeah. to read that a bit better and come out a lot faster than that. And he was still barely on the edge of his six yard box by the time the shot was taken. So, yeah. slow to react the second, there for me. I think the second goal there is just a bit of a killer. And that's. The, the, the second goal is probably the worst one as a team, and like in terms of our marking and how they get three as the ball comes in. And up until then, we'd we'd gone one nil behind to probably just a decent goal. And um, I was listening on the radio; sounded like there was always still a chance that we would get back into it. Second goal was the killer, and then just heads go down, and the third goal follows shortly afterwards. It was a poor game that saw the sacking or departure of... I keep saying sacking, mate. The departure of Chris Beach as last game in charge. The performance in itself in the first half, even though we went 1-0 down, there were moments in the first half where we we got forward. There were moments of beach ball with the flick on and and Zach Clough getting on the end of it. But, you know... They've got, they've got a good goalkeeper there, I guess, off his line nice and quick. He knows his box, yeah. obviously, very well. Um, and it, was, it, just was, it wasn't to be. Um, and like I think we've already said, a little bit desperate with the lineup changes um, to the team and maybe too much all at once. And yeah, maybe that was the undoing of it. Maybe, maybe throwing on too much of a Band-Aid, maybe just changing too much was the downfall in the end. But obviously, a couple of injuries are going to force a manager's hand and McDonald not necessarily being able to play. Um, big factor yeah. in that. Um, Mella also not being able to play. Big yeah. factor in that. Um, so Riley, also another player, not not able to play. Um, also out of the team. So all these things contributing towards having to reshuffle a lot. Um but yeah, that's it for Chris Beach, and uh, maybe that's it from us, mate. I think we've I think we've wrapped it up, haven't we? Yeah. I think we've done all right. Yeah, I think we're yeah, all right. Yeah, I quite. Do you think? Do you think we're going to make a habit of doing the live? Well, not live, but video match reviews where. Well, uh, we'll, we'll we'll see we'll see how it goes. We'll see how it goes. Um, what, what did you feel? How did you feel it went? Um. Yeah, I thought I thought it was pretty good because you know we can kind of like we can react as well as kind of like just having a pre-prepared, you know, rundown of, of what happened in the match. You know, you're actually, you're actually reacting to things. Yeah. I mean, I'm down for it. Yeah. I'm down for yeah. it. Maybe, maybe, uh, maybe in future I'll watch it ahead of time and just maybe have a couple of stopping points and that. So I've already yeah. prompt, prompt, prompt. So yeah. Yeah. I enjoyed it as well, mate. I enjoyed it. I hope the listeners mm. enjoyed it as well. Um, We'll obviously yeah. get better at we'll obviously get better at doing it and being more descriptive and stuff like that. So uh, I'm sure it'll only get better from from that yeah. from this, <laughs> this, this day this day onwards. Uh, um, what we've what we've done though, mate, is we've always done the man of the match. Yeah, and it, it's hard to give your team a man of the match when they've lost three 0 to Bristol Rovers. But based off those highlights, I'd have to say that Callum Guy looked like he was actually. Giving it a go for the most part, and I'm just going to sort of almost flippantly give it to Callum Guy. Have you got anyone in mind yeah. for you? Uh, no, not really. Otherwise, I'll just kind of go with you that um, uh, Callum Guy is the kind of highlight for us in that little short short clip that we got to watch. 
Yeah. And listen, yeah. Li- listening to the radio, I didn't hear anyone else particularly stand out. No, neither did I. Um, and I didn't see anyone really standing out on the highlights at all. So thanks very much, everybody, for listening to this week's Blue Army podcast. This has been episode 38. And uh, it's nice to be back. And I'm looking forward to next week already. Wills, thanks very much for joining us. You're welcome. Did you enjoy, did you enjoy yourself yeah. this week? Yeah. Yeah, lovely. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you know, considering it's nice yeah. to be back. <laughs> yeah, it's nice to be back. It wasn't easy, but it's nice to be back. And uh, yeah, thanks very much, Matters. And I'll see you next time. Bye for now. Yeah. <laughs>